Welcome to the show, Bobby. I am so excited to have you. How are you doing? Hi, Kellen. I'm I'm great. I'm so excited to be here. Yes, queers. Well, when we were at Queer Tech and I saw you, I was like, yes, I have to talk to Bobby. This is the perfect <laughs> opportunity. So thank you so much. No problem. Anything to uh, support my my fellow queers. <laughs> yes. All right. So I want to jump right into it. You're Indigenous. You're queer. You're a woman. It's kind of like the triple whammy when it comes to the intersectionality of folks who usually struggle in getting funded as entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. I Most people would take that in the negative route. I'm actually really curious, how did you end up using these as your superpowers when building virtual gurus? You know, I love that question. Um, a few years ago, up until a few years ago, I should say, I actually never used my, we'll call it trifecta, um, as, as a superpower. In fact, I shied away from it. And Virtual Gurus was still kind of growing, but we weren't growing to, to the needs and to where we knew we could go. We weren't growing there. We weren't getting there. Um, and then some of the media and some of the people started catching on. Hey, wait, you're you're an indigenous woman in tech. Like that's that's really unheard of. In fact, I think I'm one of the first indigenous women in tech CEOs in Canada. And I um I started thinking, wait, you know, I should I shouldn't shy away from telling my story. And so I started kind of playing with it a little bit more and then doing some some podcasts or or some media uh, interviews. And, um, and then I started realizing that all of the people like me who have been told no, have been told to not talk about their identity, have been told all of that their whole lives, including me, including my moms who are also lesbian. Um, and then that's when I thought, you know what, I'm going to do this. I'm creating a platform for people who are from the underserved communities, for people who have been told no. So if I'm not going to shout it out to the world, then how do I expect them to and how do I expect them to feel safe? So ever since I, I kind of, you know, opened that door a few years ago, it's just been exploding and Virtual Gurus is now one of the top 100 uh, fastest growing companies in Canada uh, from according to the Globe and Mail. And uh, now we've just exploded. And uh, it's amazing to see because it actually is medicine for me to speak my true, true, my true truth, to say, hey, this is who I am. Um, and so now a lot of people call me a trifecta and I've, I've, uh, I've learned to love that name. <laughs> nice. And it, the old adage is true. Like be the change you want to see in the world. Like you have to walk that path and be true to yourself. And we always tell that to people, but then doing it is a whole different story. It is. It's scary. It's scary, right? Um, you never know what's on the other side. And um, that's one of the things where it's, uh, you know, you got to be a risk taker sometimes. But at the same time, if you're living your truth, you should never be shy of it. That said, some people can't live their truth and that's OK. Um, you know, and, and don't uh, I don't want to pressure or, or make anybody feel bad for not. Um, my only hope with all of who I am and how out I am about who I am is that maybe I'll just inspire one person a day. And my motto is you inspire one person a day, you inspire a nation. Yeah. And you've uh, inspired me. Mm -hmm. Like we were talking right before here, I actually applied to virtual gurus <laughs> back in 2020. So you had already inspired me back then. Um, yeah. You were saying you're the first Indigenous queer woman to close a Series A round and virtual gurus is now valued at over $65 million, which I don't know if that's the most accurate, but that's a very <laughs> impressive number. Uh, mm -hmm. What did you used to believe about yourself before all of this happened that you now know is completely false? Um, you know, I, yeah, that's a hard one, but it's a good one. It's got <laughs> me thinking, which I love. Um, you know, I would say that um, I, I have struggled with my confidence for years, for my entire life, ever since I was small. Um, one of the things is, is when I was uh, four years old, my mom came out as, as LGBT and my entire life, I had two moms. So going to parent teacher interviews, I had two moms and back in the early eighties, this is, that was a lot, you know? Um, and then with that, I ended up actually getting a severe skin disease, um, which I obviously have still now. Um, and it's called polymorphous light eruption. So I'm actually severely allergic to ultraviolet lighting in the sun. Um, and then I was such an introvert because I was bullied a lot because of that and being from a queer family. And so I really lacked a lot of confidence. Um, I thought I wasn't confident at all. Um, I thought I wasn't going to be able to do it. I had major imposter syndrome. I didn't think I could do it. So I went online and actually hired a CEO and literally put in Kijiji, 
be my CEO because I didn't think I could do it. And um, six months after hiring that person, I took the company back and said, wait a minute, there's nobody better to do this but me. So I'd have to say it's confidence. Confidence was a huge thing for me to try to overcome. I think I'm more confident now because I'm living my truth, but I struggled with confidence to the point where it, it could have been crippling to my business for sure. Yeah. Would you say that that was kind of like a huge shifting point for you where you there was a click that happened inside of yourself where you went, hold on, like what, what was yeah. that internal experience like? You know what it was is is um, it started with the 170 investors that had started saying no to me. Um, you know, I needed to raise money. I bootstrapped virtual gurus to 1.8 million in revenue with no funding. Um, and I was raising for two years and I kept getting told no. I kept being told, don't talk about your indigeneity. Don't talk about that you're queer and that you're providing a platform for those that are doing it. Just do it. And I was thinking, wait a minute, I need to do that. And when I started feeling more and more confidence was when I started realizing that I have to do what everybody's telling me not to do. Because if I do that, then I'm creating my business based on what they want, not based on what I want and what my needs are. And this platform ultimately is based on my story. It's, it's based on my upbringing. It's based on my experiences in life where I've been told no and I've been struggling. And so I needed to kind of turn that off and I needed to say, wait a minute and not listen and put that wall around me of not listening and saying, you know what, I'm not going to do it your way. I'm going to do it my way. Once I started doing that and I started seeing more and more stories coming out um, of people that were finding safety and working in the platform to people who they would just hear my interview online to um, anything, you know, and, and seeing people come and talk to me and, and cry and tell me their stories, you know. I think that was my turning point. And then the investors that were starting to say no a lot in my raises, my first raise, especially, um, I let it feel my fire and I let it motivate me. And I actually let it lift me up more to, for me to be more stubborn and to stand up and say, yo, you're not going to say no to me. I'm going to go forward and I'm not going to let it beat me down like I did my entire life. And I think between that and everything, that's where the switch went on. And I was, I, I knew I was onto something. And, um, you know, I kind of pushed through, um, contrary to what people wanted me to do, I still did it. Do you think that as part of that experience of being more yourself, standing out there, being loud and letting that happen, you built even more community around you that it was like naturally attracted to you because of that? You know, yeah, Kellen, let's be real. Everybody likes vulnerability. Vulnerability is, is, is key. Vulnerability sells. Um, and I'm not saying that, you know, it's for everybody. I mean, you know, again, it was to the point where I could either choose to go through the vulnerable door or go through not to the vulnerable door. And I chose the, the first because I thought if I'm not going to, then who's not, who's going to. Um, and, and so certainly I do think that, um, that emotional hook and that, that personality to my story, you know, like I'm a woman in tech, that's very rare. Um, a queer person in tech and I'm a queer indigenous woman in tech. That is very rare. Um, but you know what is, is if I don't shout it out and I don't come out, then how are we to not inspire the next generation to come and be that? Now there are so many people in, te in tech. There's so many indigenous folks in tech. There's so many queers in tech and it's just amazing to see. And I mean, you know, sometimes that's the thing. Sometimes you have to be a first and you have to be the one to show that we can all do it. Definitely. Mm -hmm. In and amongst all this, was there any other kind of pivotal moment that happened for you, whether before this one or after this one, that also shifted something in you, whether that be a person telling you something or an experience you had that pushed you even further along that journey? Um, I mean, there's many, many points, but I think, you know, a few stories that stand out for me are some of my um, virtual assistants that have come to me, um, you know. And um, one of them was uh, on a morning radio show in Calgary. Um, there was, it was, I think it was on like the, uh, after the traffic news or whatnot. And um, there was a, a lovely woman who couldn't be themselves at their job. Um, they were trans, um, they were forced to dress in a suit and um, they just wanted to be themselves. And she just could, wasn't allowed. And she was driving home and was really struggling with life and where she was gonna be. And she heard my ad about we're hiring virtual assistants. She turned around her car and came to me um, and she was able to work with us for a few years and now she's successfully being who she is. And, you know, those kind of stories is what is my why. 
Um, that's my North Star. That's my why. That kind of stuff inspires me. And that kind of stuff just gives me that boost. So every day I hear stories. Um, today, I got a message on LinkedIn from a fellow that I met at Res Conference in Vegas um, two months ago. And um, a gentleman was walking by and he said, look, I just need to hug you. I don't know why. And I said, sure. Gave him a hug. And he sent me a message today saying, you know, two months ago, I, I came to you and was like, I don't know why, but I'm just drawn to you and I need a hug. He's like, I found out that you're actually my daughter's idol out here in Texas. We're rooting for you. And I was like, what? And I screen captured it. I'm going to post it. And I'm like, this is that stuff. That's inspiring. That is showing people that, okay, you know what? Live your story. And now you're helping so many other people live their story. And that that's my why. That's what carries me on every day. That's the goosebumpy stuff. Like I'm getting like a little teary out of like, <laughs> yes, do it for the community. Cause I'm such a yeah. community proponent type person that anytime I can see somebody like doing something, I just cheer yeah. them on. There's too much yeah. negativity and too much yeah. that we already do to ourselves in our own minds from whether that be our background or our raisings that we already, you know, talk ourselves down that we need to be yeah. so loud at cheering each other on when those yeah. things happen. Um, Absolutely. Continuing the cheering on, like we said before, you were the first Indigenous queer woman to close a Series A. You went from kind of your seed round to raising your Series A and Series B rounds, all pretty close together in terms of time frame. How did you mentally manage that rapid company growth? And how were you able to keep yourself grounded through that process? Okay, yeah, so we're we're raising our Series B now, like we're just jumping into it right now. Um but yeah, so when you go from in 2020, uh, right when the pandemic hit, I closed 1.25 million of a seed round after trying to raise for two years and nobody would give me money. So I was bootstrapping. Finally, was able to close 1.25 million, which is really small when we're the revenue that we were at that time. Um, not even two years later during the pandemic as well, I closed the 8.4 million, which is the series A round. Um, and that was a huge feat because trying to close during the pandemic when everybody's at home, like it was, it was crazy. It was, uh, that was, it was just, it was awesome. Um, it was accelerating, but it took me only five months to close. Um, whereas now less than two years after that, we're now realizing series B. So mass scale or hyper growth scale, as we call it, um, you know, you can either snowball and be a bunch of hamsters running in a wheel and just kind of throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing what sticks and try to figure it out. Um, or you could kind of go in a little bit more strategic. And, and as you get further and further along, you're able to be more strategic. You're, you're able to really build your company on outcomes focused and KPIs. Um, and so being able to do that was easy because of the team I've built. Um, you know, the team that I have now is, is just, they're available, they're ready, they're pumped, they've got the drive. Uh, in fact, we just brought on the, uh, as our new chief operating officer, um, the old, uh, he's the co-founder of startups.com. That's a $260 million company. And uh, he also created Fundable and helped um, companies raise over $750 million in startup funding in the U.S. He's based out of the U.S. And I was able to bring him onto the company. Um, with that, I also have an ex-marketing uh, manager at Twitter now doing our marketing. Um, you know, we have a lot of really good people on our team and they're here because of the story. They're here because of the drive. They're here because of the impact. I mean, you know, it's a it's a different story when you have your re return on investment, but your return on impact is what really drives everybody. And that's what we focus at Virtual Gurus is we're returning, we're focusing more on the return now on impact than anything. And it's driving us. We've had to take down the team a little bit, focus on KPIs, drop in a little bit more OKRs. And then here we are. Now we're just, again, going straight up hockey stick growth. Um, it wouldn't be possible without the team I have, though, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. How did the mental aspect for your personal growth in that, like, how did you keep yourself together and grounded during that? Because that personally is just like, this is a lot. <laughs> yeah, I'm tired. <laughs> All this gray hair that's over here is like <laughs> virtual gurus, personal. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm getting I'm getting a little bit tired, but um, I do see the light at the end of the tunnel, um, you know, and Again, it's motivating once you start seeing growth. It's demotivating when you're not seeing growth and you're going backwards and things aren't working well. But like in any business, you have to pivot. You have to make some changes. You have to do certain things. And then once you just do that one small tweak and then you start seeing the growth again, it motivates you. But what's more motivating to me is my, my, my staff. 
um, you know, seeing them being pumped. So that helps my, my mental health a lot more. I won't lie though, Kevin, like I've, I've hit rock bottom on my mental health. I've, I've, um, I've struggled with mental health because of being in this eye of this scale and everything. So um, my mental health is super important to me. Um, I've recently lost about 150 pounds um, and I'm actually focused on being more healthier. Um, I, our team is healthier. Uh, we have healthier people at the company. Um, I'm surrounding myself with more healthier people for those reasons. Um, I do a lot of work-life balance. I shut down at 5.30 unless I'm traveling for conferences. Uh, I take off weekends. I camp three, four days a week now in the summer. I have an RV. Like I, I do a lot to make sure that I'm, I'm staying focused. I thank you so much for saying this because mm -hmm. all we've heard for generations is just hustle life, hustle life, bro life, hustle life. And like to hear somebody who's building such an amazing, phenomenal company still manage to build in that mental health balance, that personal life balance into the structure of the company and still having it grow at the level that it's growing for you. It gives yeah. me hope for what I'm doing and building to be like, oh, yeah. I can still be a human being through the process. Yeah. yeah. I mean, somebody had said it to me a couple of months ago when I was speaking on a panel and they said, you know, you, you can't fill up the uh, cups of other people if you can't fill your own and keep your own filled. And and that was something that kind of resonated with me because there was a point in my company and in the journey of virtual gurus of scale where we didn't have the right employees and maybe we did, but we also weren't really in the right frame of mind. Like the company was kind of, there's some toxicity, there was some uh, animosity in the company. And so I realized that, you know, in all in all, that was because I wasn't in the right frame of mind. Um, and so it takes a lot to figure that out and it takes a lot to realize what you got to do. And in order, if you want your company to be healthy, you have to be healthy. And so that's something that, um, you know, plays on me every day. I read a lot of books. I, uh, you know, I, I travel, I, I do things to make sure that I'm filling my cup first. Good. Uh, mm -hmm. is speaking of reading books, you, I've heard you speak before about getting 1% better every day. I'm not sure, but I thought, did that come from the James Clear Atomic Habits, getting 1% mm -hmm. better every day incrementally? Yeah. Yeah. And so when you read Atomic Habits, make sure you follow up by reading Atomic Actions, um, you know, because then your the Atomic Actions is, okay, the habits are great, but what are the actions to hit those habits and to get to those habits? And so I've been reading Atomic uh, Actions. I'm, I'm done it now. Uh, and I, I learned a lot from that book. Um, but yeah, that's my number one thing after that is, is you know, you got to be 1% better every day. I mean, I'm going to make mess ups tomorrow and the next day and the next day. Um, but all I can do is just aim to be 1% better. And so that's all I do. I don't aim to be 1.5%, just one. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely fell in love with that book. And I took that was my big learning away from that as well as the 1% better at, at each day, every time, just like a little bit, you don't need to be the best and be everything all at once. You can just yeah. do one little thing now and move along the journey. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's one thing that I had to realize. So when I did gain all that weight, I was really unhealthy. My mental state of mind wasn't okay. Um, I I realized that that's what I needed to do is, is it's a sprint, it's not a, a marathon. And I remembered I had to be a little bit more kinder to myself, um, you know, and, and it didn't help that I'm, you know, kind of all over the media and, and all this and seeing pictures of myself online and, and, you know, and it really bothered me. And again, it was my confidence and it was this. And so I had a lot of work to do there. Um, but I think that's the number one thing about being a startup founder or being a founder of any sort is you can leverage it as medicine to make yourself a better person always. Um, you know, and that's kind of one thing that is, is pushes me every day. Definitely. And as mm -hmm. part of that journey, did mentorship play a big role for you in supporting you and helping you go along this journey? Yeah, I mean, I've had a few mentors. Um, I haven't had a lot of mentors that really supported me in the way I, I needed. Um, they did support me mentally to give me a lot more of that feedback. Um, and that was great. And I'm super thankful for them. But um, who are more of my mentors would have been the programs that I've been involved in, like the EY Winning Women. Um, we're kind of a sisterhood to the in International Women's Fellowship. I was the first uh, Canadian woman in 2022, 2023. I was the uh, only Canadian woman in the cohort of 30. So the government paid for you to go and get like, um, it's like a, a scholarship um, essentially for Harvard. So I ended up going to Harvard. 
um, and getting a degree during the COVID, during raising money, during all of it while I was doing it. And um, I was the only Canadian in, in the program, but that was 29 other sisters that I now have. And so then with that, I also made a personal board of advisories through that. And so then I'm able to talk to other sisters that are founders and we just talk to each other and be like, okay, what are we doing here? Like, I'm struggling with this. What are your thoughts? And, you know, um, there's nobody better to talk to than other people that are doing it. Yeah. The entrepreneur journey can be a very lonely, isolating yeah. journey. And a lot of people don't yeah. realize that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I'm glad that you found your sisterhood and you can bring <laughs> people together and you have those. That's why I like to have other people on the journey. Yeah. Um, I always thought I wanted to do things alone and be the lone wolf, but I've realized through my years, no, no, no. I actually like having like co-founders or other people involved because you can help bounce things off each other and help support each other and grow together. We grow in community. Yeah. We don't grow in isolation. Exactly. Exactly. And that's why COVID was so much for everybody, right? Because even for me during the pandemic, like I gained over 200 pounds during that time. Like it was crazy. And, but I wasn't healthy because all I would do is just focus on the business the whole time. It was great. We were scaling over 300% year over growth during that time. Um, but it wasn't great because then we snowball grow, grew and that's not the right way. So yeah, it all just, it's like a ripple effect, you know, it's crazy. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, what exciting things do you have on the horizon, either for yourself or for the company that you can share with us? Yeah, uh, well, we're starting to jump into our Series B funding round. Um, and so um, there's another lady, and I wanted to say, actually, for being the first Indigenous woman in Canada to close the Series A, in the U.S., I got to go for dinner with the first Indigenous woman in the U.S. to close the Series A, and she made a successful exit, which is awesome. Her name is Betsy Four. She's just amazing. Um, and so uh, I've been talking a lot with her and kind of getting involved in a lot of different areas. So Native Rising, I'm now a mentor. We're, we're building and creating more Indigenous entrepreneurs and helping them launch their businesses. Um, but for Virtual Gurus right now, uh, it's Series B funding round. So uh, we haven't quite started. We have a lot of interest already, but we haven't fully started because I'm a huge firm believer on making sure my numbers look and tell a good growth story first. And they are telling me the good growth story, but I want it to be where I want it to be before I hit it because I want to close it fast and take a break. Um, and then other than that, we are actually launching our new um, AI virtual reception um, agent. Uh, it's a bot, AI bot that will go on people's websites and it'll essentially pull out all the leads from your sites, talk to people automatically and text you their information and everything. It's actually super cool. Um, we're launching that in the next uh, couple months here, and it's, uh, it's there's going to be a lot of traction around that. I think we have like 300 people on the waiting list for it already, and yeah, it's going to be big. We're 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 really excited about that. Nice, that sounds very exciting. Mm -hmm. What about you personally? What do you have on the horizon that you're excited about? Mm, I'm getting married in um, November 30th to December 7th. I'm going to Cancun. We're having a destination wedding. Um, my wife and I, your soon-to-be wife and I, are pretty excited about that. Um, really just, you know, enjoying life and just being who I am. I also think um, after or during my wedding or after my wedding, I'm going to take a little break. Take about three, four weeks off and just enjoy and just live life with my new partner, my new wife, I should say, not my new partner. Um, and, um, you know, I fully trust that my team will, will scale the business regardless with me there, so... Yeah, well, yeah. Con big congratulations on that. That is amazing. And it's also mm -hmm. it's it's that work life balance of like, yes, you're doing amazing big things. But then you need to give that big thing time and space to breathe in order to come yes. back and continue that growth. Yep. Everything yeah. in life breathes. So it does. And, you know, you need to let your employees do that as well. Um, you know, for us, uh, like we just had like our EVP of revenue and growth um, went back to his, his hometown of Singapore. I um, mean, he's been gone for four weeks and it's like, just go, go and enjoy, have life, like, and then come back. Cause you know, he's going to be feel so refreshed and ready to rock because we're going into high growth right now. Um, you know, and another few things that we're doing with our employees is we're going to try to start uh, creative days or joy day, um, you know, where once a quarter they can take a day off and then they can, you know, go and do something, spread joy or some sort of creativity, whether it be painting, whether it be, I don't know, doing flower origami even, whatever you want to do, as long as it's creative, um, and then share it in the Slack channel. And then just, in, you know, because it's it's all about, it doesn't have to be all about work. It's, it's about that life and that balance as well.
Yeah, I love that. Thank you so much for that. That's amazing. <laughs> uh, where can everybody find out more about you or virtual gurus? Uh, I'm on LinkedIn under Bobby Reset, um, and uh, you can go to our website, uh, www.thevirtualgurus.com. Um, on there, we have everything. So you have access to our AI VR. You can have access to become a virtual assistant if you want. Um, you can have access to become a client. Um, if you really want, you can actually go to www.thevirtualgurus.com slash VIP. And uh, you'll get $200 off your first monthly package. Um, so you can do that. Uh, and you can add me. And yeah, you know, just follow me and tell me, you know, what inspires you every day. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing that with everybody. Thank you so much for being such a phenomenal guest and for such an thank inspirational you. person just by being who you are in the world. <laughs> no, thank you.